So good morning, and let, uh, let's get started. So today we have a fantastic panel to discuss uh, the future of uh, blockchain, uh, <clears throat> starting with David Yermak, who has been a pioneer in the study uh, of this topic. Uh, then we have Eric Burish, who uh, has written a super interesting paper about the limits of uh, uh, blockchain, and then Andrea Moores, who has studied the environmental impact of uh, blockchain. So uh, they're going to start uh, with a short presentation um, in this order, and then uh, uh, we're going to start a debate uh, first uh, on this table, and I will moderate, and then we're going to open for questions, and I'm sure there will be plenty of questions coming from the audience. So uh, David, why don't you start? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think most of you who are here today know that yesterday, January 3rd, was the 10th anniversary of the first block that came across the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's an auspicious time to be talking about this, despite the wild ride that we've had, especially in the last 12 months. Um, I think the attendance, we've had three years in a row, the same session more or less at the AFA. The attendance has closely tracked the price of Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> We will see where we are next year, but I actually don't even plan to mention Bitcoin. It, hopefully this is the last time today because the underlying technology, the blockchain that is the record keeping technology behind it is the real innovation and the source of value added here. What I'm going to do here is a highlight show in 10 minutes or less show six emerging use cases that are very much tied to the legacy financial system. and. What you're really dealing with here is a new accounting technology. The blockchain is a very different and I think a much better way than double entry bookkeeping of keeping track not only of financial data, but just about any data in supply chains, um, authenticating fine art, all kinds of other applications. But I'm going to focus on where we're already seeing it make its mark in the mainstream financial system. So I think one area that is really beyond dispute where change is well underway is in the international remittances. Uh, for many years, the SWIFT network, which is owned by the major banks, the SWIFT network has been pretty much the only way to send money across borders, and Ripple has positioned itself as an alternative. So here is some media coverage from the FT and The Economist, and they tend to frame this as a head-to-head -head confrontation, you know, Ripple against SWIFT, but I think this greatly oversimplifies what's really happened, which is that many people are now opening blockchains and people are even using the Bitcoin blockchain for international money transfers. So I think at the very least, the SWIFT network is going to get dragged into the modern world kicking and screaming. But what's likely to happen is that a monopolist marketplace is really in real time being transformed into a very competitive one with um, many interesting features. And we can maybe talk more about this in the panel. but. Given the delays and the fees and the hacking that has gone on for decades in the remittances system, I think this is very welcomed, especially by the customers. A second area that is, um, I think, at an earlier stage but shows enormous promise is the issuance of securities. So in August, the World Bank issued a, a, a new debt issue over a blockchain. It was actually done in Sydney, Australia, so this became known as the Bondi Bond which stands for something called the Blockchain Originated Negotiable Discount Instrument, something like this. Um, it's not the first time, though. There have been a number of high-profile cases of corporations essentially using the blockchain to bypass the system of book building and underwriting and introduce what is a new paradigm of securities underwriting. I think this has the banks running scared, and they are looking for a way to basically be the person running the blockchain. And in this case, it was an Australian bank, Commonwealth Bank, that got that mandate. But I think security issuance is changing. And um, again, the customer is probably going to be the huge beneficiary from this in the long run. Um, a third area, and I have a paper on this that I'll be presenting at a different session in the afternoon, but the initial coin offering burst out of almost nowhere 18 months ago and has grown to the point that more than 21 billion has been raised through ICOs in 2018. Um, a good benchmark is the worldwide issuance of venture capital, which is about 150 billion. So you now have an alternative way for startup businesses to raise money. 
Now, whether they're really raising money or just raising crypto tokens, and whether the market didn't fall irretrievably off a cliff six months ago, if you look at the monthly data for 2018, I think ICOs have a somewhat uncertain future, and you're already seeing a great deal of winnowing of the field and so forth. But I think this is a very interesting innovation. It is, um, as far as I can tell, the first new way to raise capital that we've seen since the 1980s. And there is unquestionably a lot of fraud, but also I think a lot of innovation in this area. And the regulators have been um, very challenged about what to do with this. I don't think we've heard by any means the last of ICOs. And there's about 100 academic papers on this and counting so far. I think probably everyone in the room at this point has an ICO paper. Um, whether we are still writing them in 12 months will be interesting to see. Um, the old stock markets around the world have been closely looking at blockchain technology as a better way to do clearing and settlement. And I think it's well known that the Australian stock exchange in Sydney, the ASX, has for about two and a half years now been looking at this very actively and is in the midst of a transition to a new blockchain system which may or may not be the first of its type. And I say that only because other stock markets around the world are also looking at the same thing. And the ASX has gone more slowly than people anticipated, but this is nevertheless, I think, still the highest profile and um, you know, really potentially game-changing remaking of a stock market that's going on around the world. But we're seeing something fairly similar in the US. Um, the US is a much more decentralized arena for trading stock. We have two major stock exchanges and not one. They share the same clearinghouse, which is the DTCC, and much of the work of counting votes and registering ownership and so forth is outsourced to a company called Broadridge. So it would not necessarily be the NYSE and NASDAQ where the trading of securities takes places, but the settlement that takes place after the trade, which still takes two days on the DTCC, but you can see from some of this publicity that both they and Broadridge have discovered the blockchain, have interesting beta tests and some smaller applications already underway. And I think it's a fairly safe prediction that within five to 10 years, most of the stock markets in the world will probably be doing the clearing and settlement much more quickly, accurately, cheaply. And for people who study microstructure, this is already an emerging area where there's a lot of research opportunity. Um, real estate is a very intriguing market. There's 20 billion, or I'm sorry, 20 trillion of unregistered real estate around the world, and another 60 trillion that is registered through what are typically very cumbersome title registration systems. And Sweden has taken the lead. It's, it's surprising that Sweden is the country that's doing this, because in many ways, this is the least dysfunctional country in the world. You know, things in Sweden are pretty homogenous work pretty well, there aren't a lot of border disputes and so forth. But they have very ambitiously created a blockchain title registration system that is going through increasingly serious tests and applications. Um, one reason they're doing this is that the error rate in Swedish real estate transactions turns out to be 9%. And if you've been to Sweden and gotten to know people, this is very surprising. It's a highly organized country. But by cutting that down to a much lower number, they think you can save hundreds of millions of dollars just in Sweden through implementing this system. Um, the US error rate is actually 30%. Um, one in three real estate transactions runs off the rails in this country and has to be redone. And um, I think the potential simply for saving money here is very big. But the real promise of this is going into the developing world where there have never been well-defined property rights in many, many countries. And there's a belief by many libertarian economists who appeal to the work of Ronald Coase that if you can use the blockchain to fix property rights in a way that would be defensible even against a change in the political regime, this would be um, potentially a way to spur economic development in a very interesting way. Um, you're seeing the Swedish system already being copied in New South Wales and Australia. Um, there's about a half dozen other countries that have variations of this, but I think the registration of real estate on blockchains um, clearly is something that has to be taken seriously as a new application of the technology. And I think other assets, including automobiles, um, Article 9 liens in this country, um, anything kept track of on financial databases where there's
some opportunity for fraud and dispute about who the true owner is, I think a blockchain in the long run may well displace the technology that's now in use. Finally, the killer app here, I think, is for the central bank to migrate the system of bills and banknotes and physical currency that we have to a big national blockchain. And the Bank of England, about four years ago, first put out a blueprint that has been widely copied by other central banks, at least as the basis for talking about this. And I think somewhat surprisingly, it turns out to be China that has been the very aggressive country that is um, making noise about launching a blockchain RemNimby maybe as soon as 2019. Um, I find this media coverage quite surprising because this is not a country where people run off their mouth at press conferences. Every word is chosen quite carefully. And they've been quite open about saying that they're developing this. It's in beta test on the campus of Tsinghua University. And I think the reason they're doing this is very, very simple, that Alipay and the, the other electronic payment systems have them running scared, that they've seen the migration of a big swath of payments to a platform that they don't control and that they can't spy on, and so that they are trying to recreate something at the central bank that allows them to continue to control the financial system in the way that they're used to. So I think you know, this may be coming sooner than people are expecting, and it would be a profound change in the conduct of monetary policy, the regulation of banks, whether you would even still have deposit-taking banks in such a system, I think is an open question. Now, the last point I want to make is that the irony here is palpable, that Satoshi hated central banks. And the reason that Bitcoin and these other decentralized coins were created was to undercut the authority of the central banks and to essentially create peer-to-peer -peer systems where people would be perhaps beyond the reach of governments. What we're seeing, of course, is exactly the opposite, that the system has been recognized by central banks as a huge opportunity to strengthen their control even more than before. Um, they are actively looking at it, as are the real estate title companies, the, the major money center banks, and so forth. And I think we're quickly moving to a place where the um, motivation for introducing this has been all but forgotten, and the legacy incumbent players in the system are seeing this as a way to become more efficient and more powerful. I think it leaves the customer better off, but whether this is really where we wanted to be in the long run and whether where this will settle 10, 20 years from now, I think is still very much an open question. So let me stop here, and um, hopefully we will return to many of these issues when we get into some of the debate and the Q&A. Thank you very much, David. Eric. OK, thank you very much, Luigi, for uh, organizing uh, this, this uh, panel. And thanks to David and Adair as well for participating in it with me. So I'm going to use my, uh, my time to present a specific academic paper uh, that I've written that's somewhat skeptical, as you'll see, of the economic usefulness of Bitcoin uh, and the Nakamoto blockchain. The title of the paper is The Economic Limits of Bitcoin and the Blockchain, or Luigi's proposed alternative, I think, more interesting title is uh, Bitcoin's Fatal Bug. So Satoshi Nakamoto's innovation uh, from a computer science perspective, and this is very much a paper about the economics of the computer science innovation, uh, was a way to generate anonymous, decentralized trust in a data set using what's called proof of work. Uh, the amount of work that goes into maintaining this trust, in, this decentralized trust in a data set, has to simultaneously satisfy two conditions. So first, it has to satisfy a, a zero profits condition for what are called the blockchain miners. And I'll go over what the Nakamoto blockchain is in detail over the next three slides. And then second, the amount of computational work has to be sufficient to make the trust meaningful, to deter majority, what's called majority attack. And together, these two conditions imply something quite damning, which is that the recurring costs of maintaining this data set, this anonymous decentralized trust in a data set, have to be large relative to the value of attacking it. That is, the flow costs of maintenance have to be large relative to the stock costs of attacking. And this is just very expensive, a very expensive form of trust. And you can think of this as like a large implicit tax. So there's a way out of this critique uh, this flow versus stock critique, and this is why, I think why Bitcoin hasn't been attacked yet, 
which is if the mining technology, the technology used to maintain the Bitcoin databases, is, is both specialized to the Bitcoin use case uh, and an attack would bring down the whole system. You should think of an attack as, as, a, as a sabotage. Uh, then an attack becomes a lot more economically expensive. But conceding vulnerability to economic sabotage is itself a pretty serious concern. And the economic analysis in this paper points to some specific collapse scenarios. So my, my overall take is I think it's an ingenious computer science innovation. It enabled a new form of trust uh, that wasn't possible before, but I, I think it's ec likely to be economically limited. Um, so let me, let me spend three slides quickly going over the details or the, the, the key high-level details of the Nakamoto uh, blockchain, just because it, it's, it's actually sort of simple once you get the hang of it, but it can be pretty confusing, um, uh, com confusing at first. So a transaction uh, consists of a sender, a receiver, an amount, and a signature. So Eric sends Luigi 10 bitcoins signed by Eric. The signature uses standard cryptographic techniques to prove uh, the sender's identity and to encode the transaction details, like the amount and the destination. Um, imagine these transactions accumulate on a, on a Google spreadsheet. So the signature actually already provides a, a, a reasonable level of, of trust. Luigi can't impersonate a transaction in which I send money unless he knows my signature. But it's vulnerable to, to sending money twice it's vulnerable to sending money that you, don't, you no longer have. It's vulnerable to deletion of transactions, et cetera. Uh, if the transactions were maintained through a trusted party, like a central bank or, or some other kind of financial institution, that would work just fine regarding all of the security issues listed above, but that requires a, a trusted party. Um, what Nakamoto invented was a way of generating trust in a, in a set of these transactions as follows. So, Users submit transactions to what you can think of as a holding tank, a pending transactions list. And then this large mass of compute power, the, what are called blockchain miners, competes for the right to add the next block of transactions to the official record. Um, each new block of transactions chains to the previous block. That's where the phrase blockchain comes from. And the validity requirements are that each individual transaction be individually valid, so it be signed correctly, and e each set of transactions be collectively valid in that if I send Luigi money, I must have had that money based on what the activity in previous blocks, and I can't in the same block send the same money to Luigi and Adair. That would be uh, double spending. Okay. The computational tournament is this large mass of compute power searches for what you can think of as an elaborate lucky number. Uh, the current Bitcoin system is, is running through 40 million trillion lucky numbers per second. So it's a, it's a lot. Um, the lucky number is a function of the new block of transactions to be added and the previous block it chains to. And this, this process is called uh, proof of work. It's hard to find the lucky number. Again, 40 million trillion uh, searches per second, but once found, it's easy to verify that it's correct. Uh, the miner who finds, a, the, again, think of it as a lucky number, reports the new block, the previous block that it chains to, uh, this lucky hash, and then earns a reward paid in bitcoins. This is where the phrase mining comes from. The way, the way new bitcoins are created is from this valid, validation uh, process. And this block reward fluctuates in value, but you can think of it as about $100,000 to fix an order of magnitude. And then other miners start working on the next, uh, on the next block. So let me quote from N Nakamoto's abstract to say what this, what this uh, set of, this protocol creates. So the network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work forming a record that can't be changed without redoing all of the work. So without redoing 40 million trillion computations for a long, you know, worth of, uh, for over a long period of time. Uh, the longest chain serves not only as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. And then with my emphasis added, as long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest, pain and, uh, uh, longest chain and outpace attackers. So anonymous decentralized trust has been created via this protocol. There's no trusted party. There's no rule of law. But its vulnerability is that it requires that the majority of compute power uh, is honest, is not attacking the system. 
Okay, so let me make a critique of this system, and it's, it's a three equation critique. This is something you could teach, uh, teach to undergrads interested in the subject. Uh, let P be the reward for the, the winning miner. Think of this as like the $100,000. Let little c be the per, per block cost of one unit of computational power. And think of this as including the rental cost of capital and the flow cost of electricity, et cetera. Let big N be the amount of computational power devoted to maintaining the Bitcoin database. So each unit of computational power has a one over N chance of winning of winning the reward. So free entry logic suggests that the amount of computational power will be n star where there's a, a zero profit condition that's satisfied. So n star c equals p block. Um, okay, so what's the incentive compatibility condition of this, of this, of this system? What's the second equation? Well, what's the, what's the cost of assembling a majority with which to attack the Bitcoin data set, um, with which to attack the Bitcoin database? Well, it would cost about n star c uh, per block. So if you have 41 million trillion units of computational power per second, you have a majority. Um, there's a parameter in the analysis alpha which uh, computationally, which defines the, the expected duration of an attack, a uh, net of the rewards that you're earning back during the attack. Um, and I'll simulate that in, in a few slides. Uh, let capital V attack be the value of a successful attack. I'll discuss that in a few slides as well. So the incentive constraint is that the cost on the left-hand side, alpha n star c, of launching an attack uh, has to be larger than the value of an attack. That, that's the incentive requirement for the system not to induce uh, a majority attack. And then the critique is put these two equations together, and you get a third equation that on the left-hand side is the per block payment to the miner who successfully validates a block of transactions. And on the right-hand side is the value of an attack on the system uh, with, a, with a constant term alpha floating around. And in words, the equilibrium per block payment to miners for maintaining the blockchain has to be large relative to the benefits of attacking it. Um, the, flow has to be, the flow payment has to be greater than the stock value of an attack. And the economic point is this is just a very expensive form of trust. And the reason is it's, is it's memoryless. The system is only as trustworthy as the amount of computational power being devoted to it uh, right now. Usual alternative mechanisms for generating trust are relationships, brands, all supported by uh, rule of law, and those are a lot less memoryless. Um, the, the computational security point to make is that this is a very linear form of, of, uh, of security. It's linear in the amount of computational power. Uh, so, and, and if you put, if V attack is a billion dollars versus a million dollars, the price you have to pay to miners to not induce that kind of attack is a thousand times higher. It scales very linearly as a, uh, as a security uh, protocol. And the usual alternatives are, again, laws, force, uh, or traditional cryptography, which scales a lot better. Um, so what, what's the nature of the attack? So the attack is not that uh, an attacker can, quote, steal all the Bitcoins. That would require not just a majority of the compute power devoted to Bitcoin, but breaking modern cryptography. Rather, the mo most canonical attack, and the one that Satoshi Nakamoto was worried about in his paper, is what's called double spending. So in, double spend in a double spending attack, in one block, I, I spend a large amount of Bitcoin. I send a billion dollars of Bitcoin to Luigi in exchange for a billion dollars of gold. I wait for that transaction to be added to the blockchain. And then after some period of time, after I get the gold, I then effectively reverse that transaction from the blockchain. And I can do this with certainty if I control uh, a, majority, um, a, ma a majority of the compute power. Um, so under some assumptions that are detailed in, in the paper, you can think of this attack through the same equation uh, as before, but on a per transaction basis. So the, the per transaction cost uh, of, of putting a transaction onto the Bitcoin blockchain, the per transaction payment to miners uh, has to be large relative to the value of the transactions you can put through the system, uh, where this V transaction object is a statistic on the largest feasible transactions. So again, if I can transact $1,000 easily, that's quite different from if I can move tens of millions of dollars of wealth uh, around the system easily. Uh, there are computational simulations in the paper, and they suggest that, th that this leads to what we, we can think of as large implicit uh, 
uh, tax rates. If it becomes easy to move large amounts of wealth around uh, via Bitcoin, the tax would have to be substantial to, to not induce uh, a double spending attack. Um, so there's a way out of this critique, which I think explains why Bitcoin has not been attacked yet, uh, which is that if both the mining technology is specific to Bitcoin, so the, the, there's spe specialized hardware whose sole purpose uh, is to perform the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin hashing function, uh, um, and the attack is in best interpreted as a sabotage that causes a subsequent large decline in the value of Bitcoin, then you should charge the, the attacker not a, a rental cost of capital, but a stock cost of capital. And to, to fix ideas, consider the extreme case of 100% collapse in the value of Bitcoin. Double spending becomes pointless. I send Luigi a billion dollars of Bitcoin. He sends me a billion dollars of gold. I undo that billion dollar transfer of Bitcoin, but I'm now left holding a billion dollars of Bitcoin that's no longer of any value. Um, so I should charge the and I should charge the attacker the stock value of the very specific capital that no longer has economic use. So the new constraint you get is on the left hand side you put the stock cost of the capital, and on the right hand side you put the value of a sabotage attack. And this would be a few billion dollars as opposed to a few million dollars. So it's a substantial difference. But I, I I would suggest to this audience that it's a bit of a pick your poison argument. Either you need to concede the possibility. Uh, for, for this argument to be your defense against a, an attack, you need to concede the possibility of a sabotage of Bitcoin, an outright collapse. And you then have to be worried about a, an attacker that's motivated by sabotage per se as opposed to double spending. So you're left choosing between either high implicit tax rates uh, or risk of, of collapse. Um, suppose for purpose of discussion that I'm right and that the reason that the Bitcoin blockchain hasn't been attacked um, is this latter constraint, is that the attacker would have to pay the stock cost of the attack, but that it would be vulnerable to attack if you could pay the, the flow cost, so the equation two as opposed to equation two prime. The model then suggests some scenarios that would precipitate an attack and a, and a collapse. So the, the first scenario is just the, the chips get, get a lot cheaper. Um, and this could happen either as the, um, the specialized chips for mining the Bitcoin blockchain, either as that market matures, so Samsung's entered, others are, if that, 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 if that market matures, the, chi the chips could get cheaper. If they became rentable, then that would be game over, I think. Um, or if the value of Bitcoin itself fell for other reasons, then there would be a glut of chips relative to the amount needed for mining equilibrium. And that would be another way of creating a surplus of cheap chips. Um, second, if, if repurposable chips get efficient enough, then repurposable rentable capital could be used to attack the, uh, attack the system. Or third, if sabotage becomes sufficiently tempting. So if, if Bitcoin becomes economically important enough, then it is at risk of getting attacked. Um, so just to conclude, I, the anonymous decentralized trust enabled by Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, computer science innovation, um, I think of as ingenious. Uh, it's a new form of trust, but just economically quite expensive. Um, the flow cost of maintaining the data set has to be large relative to the value of attacking the thing. Um, I'll emphasize that the model is consistent with early use cases of Bitcoin and the blockchain. Um, low lowish value uh, black market purchases, lowish value international remittances. What I'm skeptical about is Bitcoin as a store of value akin to gold, or Bitcoin becoming a major component of the global financial system, or the use of the Nakamoto blockchain by, by businesses and government. I'm, I'm not skeptical regarding the use of distributed databases more broadly. I'm sure in the discussion uh, we'll, we'll, discuss, we'll discuss whether distributed databases should be should be called blockchain, should be called distributed databases, what's intellectually new, what's, what's, what's new from a computer science perspective, what's new from an economics perspective. But, and, and indeed, what my paper highlights is it's exactly the aspect of Satoshi Nakamoto's blockchain that's so innovative relative to distributed, uh, traditional distributed databases, this anonymous decentralized trust that emerges from proof of work uh, that I think might ultimately also be its Achilles heel that also makes it so economically limited. So let me, let me stop there and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And um, Adair, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, 
uh, for putting together this, this panel. It's a delight to be here. Um, this, I'm going to talk about the environment, and, and this is new work uh, based on, on some work I'm doing with Matteo Benetton and Giovanni Compiani, who are both at Berkeley with me, so just to give them credit here. So Eric uh, already summarized this slide, just this is my background slide about proof of work. Let me just be clear about one thing. The, 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 the last thing that Eric said about that what Eric and, and what I'm talking about in terms of the proof of work implementation um, where we have a completely democrat democratized system and no central agent really is, is a disjoint uh, topic somewhat to some of the applications that David was referring to. On the other hand, we are bulking them all together in conversations. And so what comes out in this, this, this panel is really, really a profound need to start doing a better job as a finance uh, uh, academic profession as a whole in understanding where our, our innovations are leading to wins and where they're not win leading to wins. And hopefully, this will be the, the subject that we can continue in, in, um, in the rest of this panel. So energy. So what I want to talk about is energy. And the, as Eric laid out, the crypto miners, you know, they, they, they are in an arms race in computing power. And the, the firms are competing um, to, to solve the, the the, the problem and, and win, win the block and in a winner take all reward system. Okay, so, so we already have that, that laid out very nicely in the last presentation. Um, why can't these, this problem be simplified? Um, and the, the, there's a need for scarcity in the ultimate number of coins. There's a need for, for um, a limit in the number of the size of the transactions in a block being validated. And it leads to what we end up with is, is a block being solved every 10 minutes on, on average with a difficulty adjustment, okay? And all that is just to motivate two things. One, we're using a ton of energy. Two, we're not clearing many transactions, and I'm gonna keep coming back to those. Okay, so the, the, the nature of my, my talk is who wins and who lo loses in, in crypto mining, um, and the, the natural first answer is the Earth loses. And just looking at today, I know, I know David and I were chatting before, that there's lots of projections about how the use of electricity in, in the mines is going to, to, whatever, take over the moon or whatever it is. But the, the, just today, what, what we're using is 0.2% of world energy by some estimates. Um, there's, there's projections that are higher. This the equivalent of about 5 million US households, um, energy use. Um, if you look at the Bitmain, which is the main producer of machines, their IPO, the, their IPO, the, in their IPO, you, you can read the, 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 the documentation and the amount of machines they've sold in the last 18 months is larger than that. So, so I, I think that these estimates are fair of where we are in terms of the total consumption of electricity. Number two. Um, the energy consumption of electricity did not, uh, did not crash with the price of Bitcoin. It has come down recently with the, the recent price and regulation troubles, um, but, but the January 2018, when the, the Bitcoin prices uh, started falling, did, was not a period when you saw the energy consumption falling. So the hashers kept hashing. Number three, mining does happen in coal producing regions, okay? There's a big push to talk about, oh, you know, the mining, the crypto mining only happens in, in renewable, and, and, and even in, in that, people will talk about excess hydropower. That's actually not true, right? Uh, we need to be quite skeptical of, of this terminology. So this picture uh, that I have here is from a very, very nice report coming out of Cambridge, um, and I've just cut one piece of it. The, the size of the dots are the size of the Bitcoin mine mining that's going on in these different regions, the different provinces in China. And the big dots, um, Xinjiang, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, Inner Mongolia and Hebei are, are, are all coal mining areas. The, the exception to that of the big dots is Sichuan, which is the, the, the one sort of in the middle. So the, the, the quote that this report says that the majority use some share of renewable energy 
in their energy mix, well, I'm not so, so sure we should take that sum very seriously. There is a ton of coal being burned for producing, um, for, for feeding into the Bitcoin mining. Um, furthermore, if you look outside of China, which right now is accounting for about 70 to 80 percent of the, the mining, and that's a declining amount. If you look outside of China, in Russia, in the Caucasus, New York State, et cetera, these are coal regions often. And furthermore, we see in Australia and in the U.S. in places where we have examples of reopening coal shutdown facilities to, to do Bitcoin mining. So the idea that we're not burning bad energy, if you will, um, it's just not true. Uh, the scaling up is environmentally infeasible. Here I've done a simple calculation using Visa and PayPal calculations and what, how the, the, what the cost is uh, for a transaction clearing. And so to clear all of Visa's transactions on a daily basis would be an energy equivalent use of 2.16 billion U.S. households, which is of course, larger than the U.S. population, right? Um, so that stands where it is. I, the, the, the paper that I'm writing with Matteo and Giovanni, uh, we start with the same equation that, 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 that Eric laid out here, uh, where X is the, the electricity use. And we have the standard problem that I think the textbooks have in fishing, that, that if there's an externality, in which case it, here we're, we're talking about a pollution externality, that you cannot solve this pollution externality and the cost um, with a tax regime needs some sort of global restriction on quantity. You know, ideally for the social optimal, we, we should see lower energy consumption, but this, this solution doesn't, does not come out of uh, incentives. Um, so finally here on setting up that the, the earth is losing, we've, try to understand where the location, and this is where we're going in, in this work, where, where the location of, of Bitcoin facilities are and why governments allow them. And the anecdotes that you read from local media, we've been doing a lot of reading to collect a, a database of, of articles, if you will. Um, the anecdotes from China talk about tax revenues and sometimes subsidizing energy to be able to gain um, tax revenues on the other end. The anecdotes from the caucus regions also, and, and, and yet you can find examples where cities and, and small regions end up where the, the, the electricity in the winter has blackouts and people are cold. Um, anecdotes from the U.S. and Scandinavia talk about local economy spillovers, and, and some, but even here you find similar issues where you have electricity shortages for other uses. So uh, let me sh briefly show you some, some empirical evidence for, which we're just starting on pollution, tax revenues, and the crowding out of other energy use following those anecdotes. So we collected some data from, from the China uh, statistical yearbooks at the city level, and I'm going to look at pollution, tax revenues, and energy crowding out. And this, these are very simple estimations at this point, but the idea is to use changes in city city outcomes related to whether mining is happening in those cities. And these are very preliminary, so I'm going to try to use, to, to, uh, use language that's suggestive only. only. So in terms of pollution, um, our finding is that in areas where there is coal crypto mining, not hydropower crypto mining, um, in the post period, if you will, that coal crypto mining pollutes. Right? That's just supporting the, the, that picture from the Cambridge report where those big dots are uh, in China. Second, in, tax, in terms of tax revenues, the, the incentive that, that I laid out is that the local governments have an incentive to, to allow crypto mining, and, and we find evidence that that's definitely true. Um, the, tax re the, the corporate tax revenues go up in the cities where crypto mining has, has come about, and you know, in particular, what we see is that there's more GDP per energy use in these cities, supporting the, 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 the a local government decision to, to allow these, these uh, mining to generate more taxes. And, and the, the last of my slides on, on these results is uh, probably the most speculative at, the, at this point, but uh, in terms of crowding out, whether other energy uses are, get, are crowded out, um, the, the 
the evidence at this point suggests that uh, cities in coal crypto mining areas either experience a net crowding out, you see a negative coefficient there on the, the log fixed assets investment in coal crypto mining areas, or that there's a positive selection of mining locating in declining cities. Um, and we need to do more work on those. Both of those are supportive of the stories that I laid out in the anecdotes. So to conclude, um, this initial evidence and, and generally what I, I'm presenting uh, that supports the anecdotes that we're, you know the concerns about pollution should be taken seriously. Um, and I, I, sh I should add, you know, there's m many people talking about how the proof of work is going to be um, improved, be replaced, be become irrelevant by by concerns of um, attacks and other things. But we should be taking the concerns of pollution seriously today and not waiting for it for the solutions to to evolve. Uh, local governments do have an incentive to allow crypto mining. Crypto mining potentially crowds out other use of energy in these areas. And we need to, talk, we, in our next draft, we'll talk more on the remedies and do better estimation on, on causation. Um, a big picture plea for me um, is that hopefully that we can turn our attention on the supply side of the crypto assets and understand um, some of the, these costs that are not being uh, price and, and not be and the benefits being realized by a few where the costs are being spread out across the earth um, There's a lot of papers on the program this this weekend, but very almost none go down this this path. So thank you Thank you Adair. and uh, so let me go back to David David uh, you started uh, very uh, triumphantly about the magnificent future of uh, blockchain. Now we have heard uh, two presentations that uh, are may, uh, much more critical. So, uh, first of all, when you talk about blockchain, do you talk about uh, distributed ledger, do you talk about uh, the Nakamoto blockchain, and uh, which one has, has a future in your view? I think this whole area is subject to confusing terminology that people often say blockchain when they mean distributed ledger. People are not terribly precise about defining their terms. And it's also important to realize that blockchains have been with us all the way back to 1991 when they were first proposed as a way to validate the ownership of intellectual property. So this is not that new and it's really the Nakamoto application that caught people's imagination. Um, I think the value has already been proven out in the legacy financial system and the number of blockchain committees, projects, startups within the big banks and so forth is all you need to see. In fact, just this week I saw that the government of Italy had named a national blockchain commission. You were strangely absent, but they did identify 40 Italian experts to figure out how the whole national economy could benefit from this. But these are mostly private blockchains. Um, I think many of the issues raised by Adair and Eric have you know, really captured the attention of economists and the public and pointed out weak points. And the question in the open public blockchain is whether the, these can be overcome. And let me make just one quick observation about each presentation. Um, in the case of Eric's, he said that trust is the alternative to this. Trust turns out to be really, really expensive. We create trust through a system of deposit insurance for too big to fail banks. The cost of this runs into the tens of trillions. Um, I don't deny that the proof of work system is expensive, but you have to consider the alternative. And I think most people in the room are old enough to remember the great financial crisis that we are only now emerging from. So the attempts to create trust have been um, only partly successful. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in terms of the environment, I think the great weakness of Adair's logic is that energy is fungible. And if somebody is using energy in a coal mining region to mine Bitcoin, it's not that if they weren't there, someone else wouldn't be using the power. Um, people mine Bitcoin in China because there are distortions in the market that make the marginal cost of energy very, very cheap. In fact, this story in Inner Mongolia, which is the number one destination for this, is that somebody built a hydroelectric dam in Inner Mongolia without permission from the local party. 
and then the dam was finished and the bribe wasn't big enough to hook into the grid and so they had all this electricity with nobody to buy it and so the Bitcoin people came in. Now, this wouldn't happen in a real country with a real government. It happens in a system where there's corruption, where there are huge subsidies and people will go and burn the energy. And the problem is not that people are mining Bitcoin, it's that the system of energy distribution is corrupt and inefficient. That's where the real attention needs to be put. Um, most of the Bitcoin mines that are being opened these days are in the tundra. They're in places like northern Quebec, northern Sweden, Iceland, where you get geothermal power for free. Um, I think the coal mining narrative is greatly distorting the economics of the situation. And there are huge incentives for Bitcoin miners to seek out sources with very low marginal cost and to go to regions that are very cold, where you can actually cool the equipment just by opening the windows. And this turns out to be places where very few people live and where you're probably not displacing people from the energy grids. Um, these economics also apply to the data centers run by Barclays and JP Morgan, which are also being built in the same regions. And I think in the long run, it's not going to be China with you know, subsidized coal that is very cheap for people to use. It's going to be um, Arctic regions where most of this mining is done and is, in fact is already being done. And I think the economics of this you know, really needs to focus on not distortions in the market, but on market clearing practices that are you know, very easy to observe already. I can see Adair getting excited, so please uh, respond. So a lot of what you just said is, it's just not true. Right? I mean, it's just not true. So I, I, I wish I had a whole list of examples where we talk about Australia, which I, let, I, I, I think it doesn't count with China in, in the, the way you describe local governments in, in, in less, not being as developed and, and subject to corruption. Opening new coal mines for, for uh, crypto mining, or we could talk about the senator from Montana who was pleading in Congress to not close a coal mine that's been scheduled to be closed because of local economy spillovers. And by the way, the average Bitcoin mine employs 20 people. And, and so it, the, the, the arguments that, that, yes, Iceland, yes, in Washington state, yes, there are places where we're using excess hydropower that's available, that's totally true. But that does, that's not everything, right? It's not everything and it's not even, clear this, the majority, because of the, the vast amount of mining that's happening in Inner Mongolia and the other cold regions of China where they're, they're, they're mining coal. So just to ignore these with anecdotes of Iceland, I just th I think we're, we're doing a huge disservice. And by the way, the huge attention of economists to this, I, I, again, I urge, urge you to look at the list of papers about Bitcoin and blockchain on the program and look for the word energy or environment. It, we don't have a huge a attention of economists to this, to this issue and we are in a situation where we do actually care about the environment. Do you want to respond or do you want to move on? I, I think where we may find common ground here is that the externality from burning coal should be priced and that you know some type of tax on the use of coal. But if, if Australia is opening up a new coal mine it's not because somebody said, oh, I want to mine Bitcoin and goes to the government and said, oh, well, let's dig up some coal. It's simply because the demand for energy has risen and the Australians have decided that this is their cheapest alternative. Now, should they be using nuclear or hydro or solar? Or, you know, maybe they should, but this is really a, um, a, a public economics question about how to, how to price ec you know, externalities from pollution. Um, I don't think you can blame Bitcoin for being the marginal user and saying that they're causing you know, climate change to occur. They are just one of many people. Um, I have a student paper that I just graded in my crypto course that compared cattle raising and the methane emitted by cattle around the world, which they argue is 50 times higher than Bitcoin. And one really needs to go murder all the cattle if you're worried about emissions and so forth well before you get down to Bitcoin, which is far down the list of, of perpetrators in climate change. I'm not going to show you win this battle with Adair, who is vegetarian, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but can I just respond? You should look, yes. you should search the word coal mine, 
Bitcoin and Australia, and everything you said about the reason that mine is opening is just not true, right? They're opening it by a Bitcoin company for Bitcoin uses only. And, and just because the cows also pollute doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned with cars and Bitcoin. So I think the, if I want to settle this debate, clearly this is going to increase the demand for energy. And unless sort of uh, energy is free, or it's all uh, sort of solar or, uh, or wind energy, is going to increase uh, the CO2 emission will have a, a negative impact on global warming. Now, the magnitude, I think, is to remain to be decided. But the big question is, for what? I think that uh, at the moment, uh, those expenses of energies are to maintain basically a gambling place where no real transaction take place. Uh, because uh, if you look at the 0.4% of world energy that was used, whatever she's saying, is used for what practical purpose? I, I, I use wait, wait. point about uh, Wall Street, Louis. <laughs> yeah. At least I think that Wall Street has some value in, in setting prices, in determining, in raising capital, etc. Yeah, I, I don't still really want to say that the financial system isn't useful for our economy. I mean, it's a very dangerous. <laughs> Is that really where you're going? Is that Bitcoin is more useful than the financial system? I think really you have you to, a, a new technology, which is um, probably the most interesting thing since double entry bookkeeping came in in the 14th century. And to so try to this strangle This might be it, relative to accounting. And it's, just, it's not that interesting. <laughs> to strangle this in the crib would be a, a huge error to, to try to regulate this thing out of existence. And I think, frankly, most of the regulation is coming from the banks leaning on the regulators to, um, to help keep them relevant. Um, there is really a very interesting system, which you laid out yourself very well, to create trust on a passive basis without the need for a corrupt, bribable third party. And um, to turn your back on this, I think, is um, you know, potentially Wait, can, a huge error. Can I just clarify? So there's a, there's a slippery yeah, Mike. macro. There's a, a slipperiness in, in your argument, which I'm trying to understand for myself, which is that a lot, all of your examples were about blockchains that were trust ultimately comes from sources other than a large decentralized mass of compute power. But then you're talking about this magical innovation, which the, you know, the computer science innovation was the anonymous decentralized trust. Blockchain without anonymous decentralized trust to computer scientists is just a database. And if you want to replace the word blockchain in your slides and say databases are going to change the world, the databases are going to be important in the future, that's certainly true. I mean, that's, think, picture an economy without databases. That's going to be less useful than an economy with databases. But there's this slipperiness where the, because the word blockchain gets thrown about in kind of a con, confuse, confusing way, I'll, it, it, it led a lot of people to invest in cryptocurrencies, I think sometimes thinking that they were investing in databases, in, you know, in, in, in these useful cases for blockchains, which are just, to a computer scientist, just a database. A, a particularly architected database, a database that's append only, a database in which different parties have, have different thoughtful permissions set up in advance, but it's just, to a computer scientist, that's just a database. And the, the 1991 innovation that you referred to is also just a database with, with a particular way of doing time stamping that ultimately relied on a third party source of trust. Right? They put a hash of the current state of their database into the New York Times each week. And that was a way of a anchoring trust in some third party that, um, but it, it, I'm, some, I'm, I, I'm not sure exactly what the, a question. I'm not but, sure uh, what the question is. Yeah. yeah. Are, I, can, Can I try to rephrase the yeah. question? I, I think that uh, this is, to me, the fundamental question. So I think we all agree on this panel that uh, distributed uh, databases are going to be important, are important, and it will be more important in the future. So I think that uh, nobody disputes this. Uh, we also think that many of the applications you listed, which are real, are important, and people pay attention, uh, don't rely on uh, the innovation of Nakamoto. And in most importantly, they are not really uh, self-trusting 
mechanism uh, completely decentralized. They have a few parties that are trusted and are very important, uh, and they're going to get all the rents. So much of the rhetoric around uh, the Nakamoto revolution, if you want, was uh, we're going to make a world in which everybody is the same and nobody's going to earn rent for reputation and blah, blah, blah. And uh, all the application you describe, starting with the last one of the central bank, goes exactly in the opposite direction. So the question is, do you see a future of, uh, of the Nakamoto uh, blockchain or, or some other types of blockchain? And this is, I want to ask Eric later, because I, I've heard a lot of people uh, hypothesizing that uh, this fatal bug could be fixed. Uh, and you can have a decentralized database. So the question is, what, what future do you see? Do you see simply a future of uh, uh, distributed databases but with central parties, or do you see a future of a new kind of uh, uh, blockchain? Yeah, very much the latter. And Luigi, the, the slides I prepared were simply what you had asked me to do. Oh. And, and, and that's, <laughs> that's, that's why I picked out those examples. And I think there's no question that the... Um, if you look at the number of people working on blockchain projects and the throughput of volume, it's clearly in the permissioned model within the major banks that the traction has, has occurred so far. But I do think in the long run that you definitely have a future with these systems. That um, The problem has been, I think, correctly identified by the other two panelists, which is the, um, the cost and the complexity of the proof of work. And I think that there's got to be ways to improve on this before it scales up. But fortunately, there are doctoral students and young faculty working on this, a lot of the greatest minds. And I wouldn't underestimate the threat that this peer-to-peer -peer model that cuts the trusted third party out will pose in the long run to banks and title insurance people and so forth. I think um, there's fundamentally simply a coordination problem of how to get people to migrate away from the old system to the new one, which is an interesting problem. And I wouldn't underestimate the ability of the legacy industry to protect itself through regulation, you know, through running to the legislature, to the SEC, to whatever regulator might provide them some cover. And most of their energy has been focused on this with some effectiveness in the past year. But I think in the long run, special interests tend to melt away. There are quotes from John Maynard Keynes about how their interests, you know, the influence of special interests are greatly exaggerated. And I think you've got a real technical innovation here that in the long run is going to leave a huge footprint in the financial system and has, um, you know, really attracted some of the best minds in the economic world um, to study it. And I, you know, am very, very comforted by when I read about who's going into this area as a researcher, you see people like Susan Athey, Larry Summers, Glenn Whale, and so forth. Um, some of the very most creative and imaginative people in the field see the value of this. And it's, it's very exciting and I think very promising. Please. So, so j just to kind of piggyback off that, I think a, 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 a very interesting open question at the moment is whether, there, whether or not, um, either through positive proof or some kind of negative proof, uh, a, another protocol for generating anonymous decentralized trust in a data set that's less constrained by the arguments uh, I laid out in my paper. I think, I think my argument is pretty damning for um, Nakamoto proof of work longest chain. So if you take, if you take that specific protocol literally, I think, I think my argument's pretty, I mean, I'm, it's my arguments, of course I think <laughs> this, but I think it's pretty dispositive that it's a, it's an, a really expensive way to generate trust and that if that protocol becomes more economically useful, it will become vulnerable to, uh, to attack. That doesn't, that's not dispositive on the bigger question though, which is, is there some modification um, to Nakamoto proof of work or is there some other protocol like proof of stake that more cheaply generates anonymous decentralized trust in a data set. I think that's just an, at the moment an open question. There's a lot of, as David said, there's a lot of brain power uh, devoted to some variant of that question. I think the economics and finance profession could devote, what, what our, our comparative advantage might be in proving an impossibility theorem. So it, it, I don't know if the answer is positive or negative. If the answer is negative, it's not going to come from an entrepreneur, it's going to come from an academic. Yeah. Right, so I think that would be a great 
Um, I don't I don't know if this answer is negative or not. That's a good work a by good Bruno thing to work Meyer on. on the trilemma is probably the best I've seen on this. But you, I I completely agree with this. Along the line of your argument, isn't there a broader sort of a risk that as uh, whatever, let's say, Bitcoins becomes more accepted, more traded, uh, the, the benefit from undermining it becomes enormous because uh, you don't have only the ability of double spend. If you can short Bitcoins, then you can take very large position and then trying to damage, and then the, the the resistance to that uh, thing becomes very, very weak. In, in fact, we have seen uh, with many financial institutions that they work uh, very well until they start to support large financial markets. And then even the most trusted institution like LIBOR, uh, they are corrupted. Uh, so uh, isn't that like a general uh, theorem that uh, as liquidity, et cetera, becomes bigger, then uh, it's impossible to sustain these things? There we go. <laughs> yes, that is, yes, Luigi, that is a general theorem. That Thank is you a for theorem, it. It's the yes. Zingales <laughs> theorem. You can, Zingales 2019, it's the first Zingales theorem of the new year. Um, so I, I think it's an inter interesting hypothesis. Um, yeah, I, I think that it dovetails with, with the, the point I'm trying to make in my paper, which is it, if, if, Bitcoin be, if Bitcoin were to become more financialized, then it will also become more vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable to attack. And that, that's really the, 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 lo the logic of, of the argument. It's a way of squaring how, why it hasn't been attacked. Uh, yeah, I mean, open interest on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for Bitcoin futures is, last I checked, uh, about 100 million bucks. It's, it fluctuates, so if, if, that, if that number is not correct today, forgive me. Um, that's less than the cost of an attack. Also, if you it did a short sales attack via the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, then rule of law would probably kick in, right? That, um, you probably run afoul of various kind of um, futures market regulations. Uh, I'd also note that a, a lot of the smaller cryptocurrencies have been majority attacked. Uh, Bitcoin hasn't yet, Ethereum hasn't yet, but Bitcoin gold was, and the, the attackers successfully made off with 20-something million dollars from majority attacking it. And the, and the reason it, in, intellectually or economically is that the attackers were able to use um, hash power from a larger currency, so the same hashing function, um, to attack a smaller currency, and therefore we're able to attack paying a flow cost, not a stock cost. So it's exactly the, the economic logic of, of my paper, where if, if an attack can be conducted on a flow cost basis, these things are really vulnerable. And it's only, it's only so long as the attack costs a stock, you know, costs the, the stock value of the capital, which has to be specific and plummet in value to zero after the attack, uh, that the system is secure. So let, let's go a, a bit back to finance, given this is a finance puzzle. And uh, David, you have emphasized the, the role um, of blockchain in, in raising capital that, is, as you mentioned, has become very important last year. We'll see whether it's going to be also this year, but definitely last year was very large. Um, besides sort of uh, the technical part about uh, the stability of the Bitcoin chain, et cetera, but why this method is so much better than in the past? Because uh, I think we have known that investment bankers were making a bundle in every IPO for many, many years. I don't think that uh, was discovered in 2017 or 18. Uh, we have known for a long time. And people have tried to bypass it. Uh, for those of us who are a little bit older, we remember when Google went public, they tried to do it for an auction to, to bypass it. So is the, the problem has been there. People have tried to bypass it. Uh, they've not succeeded uh, yet. Why now? Well, I think the advantage of the initial coin offering is that it is both transparent and liquid. Um, if you look at other ways of raising entrepreneurial finance, typically you lock up your money for many years, and it's very hard to get valuation estimates of how the firm is really doing. So you see a lot of mark-to-market fantasy that ends up in the portfolios of university endowments and so forth, but who knows if it's correct or not. Um, I think what's attractive for the providers from the supply side is simply that you have a liquid and transparent mechanism here for raising capital, 
that seems to solve many of the problems that have been in the markets for venture capital, angel finance, for equity, for small firms, and so forth. Um, I think you're correct that the critique of IPOs goes back, you know, many papers by Jay Ritter and others back into the early 90s and so forth. These problems are well understood. And I view this really as a breakthrough. I would be careful to say that these people are not raising equity capital because it's not clear where you put this on the balance sheet, and this is a problem now for the regulators. But they are definitely raising capital in a way that is much more liquid and transparent. And for the, the people who invest in these firms, this seems to have great appeal. So we're, we're mixing apples with oranges, and I'm, I'm curious how you, th you think about this, David. The, the Luigi queued this up talking about the comparison of ICOs and IPOs. And you switched it to comparing ICOs with raising venture capital or angel finance, where true, right? The valuation is not transparent. In IPO, we don't have that problem. Um, and then in your presentation, you made the interesting comment about the nature of these firms and the the, the tokens and the trade and you know the the value of the translating these things into to real real economy. A number of the the ICOs, and this is not completely true, but a number, um, the majority of them are related to the industry itself as opposed to being, you know, a biotech innovation. I think two points, Adair. The, um, the IPO, I'm not very confident, gives you a signal of the value of the firm. One of the great lessons from the wave of IPOs in the late 90s was that the float in these deals was so small. Um, my favorite was the, um, the Palm IPO that had a 3% public float and was valued at, I think, $60 billion on the first day, where people simply multiplied the closing price by the total number of shares, 97% of which were locked up. So I think you know a lot of games are played with IPOs to take advantage of frothy demand at the top of the market, but they don't give an accurate signal of the value in a way that we, I think, have seen much more from ICOs. Um, now, when you ask about the types of the firms. Are, I think you're referring to the fact that the failure rate has been quite high. And No, the right. actual, the nature of ICO firms do not look like, if you look at the industry breakdown, it doesn't look anything like angel or VC or IPO firms, right? It's not even close. I, I don't know the answer to that. A lot of them are in the technology industry, and that certainly tr is true of angel and, and VC finance. Um, Many of the more successful ones have to do with the building of platforms. And we would think of firms like Facebook and Google that are essentially online magnets for large numbers of audiences. This is what many of the ICO issuers are attempting to replicate is the um, creation of a focal point where a lot of traffic on the web will go there. So um, I think these, in fact, are firms that were financed through these other channels. But FinTech platforms, yeah, the I, majority, right? But it's, you're right. Not, I don't see yeah. any biotech ICOs. I, I'm sure they're out there if you look closely enough. But these have tended to focus on areas where the, um, the, the economics of, of platform building and so forth is the, the key point of differentiation of, of who's been successful. You, David, you mentioned a very important point, which is liquidity. Liquidity, as we know, is a bit on the eye of the, the beholder because when uh, there is a lot of excitement, you get liquidity. Um, when the excitement is fading, and we're probably in this moment, uh, we'll see whether the liquidity stays. And you open up the market for IPO, unregulated IPO, in the late 90s. Everybody and their brothers would have bought anything that had dot com after it. In fact, they were transforming company, adding a dot com after it in order to increase the valuation. So now we are in the blockchain uh, kind of thing that uh, you relabel everything that uh, you want to sell as blockchain, and people come, and there is a huge demand, and there is huge liquidity. Uh, will it last? I'm trying to say. Uh, besides bypassing the investment banks, which I'm all for, uh, besides sort of bypassing regulation that I'm for or not depending on which regulation, uh, what is the advantage? Because the liquidity is something that in this moment is there, in the future it might not be. What is the advantage of uh, the blockchain IPO, the ICO, versus a traditional IPO? I think you're accessing capital without borders. And you know this 
has been very interesting to see the competition among governments, which currently is either being won or lost, depending on your point of view, by the Swiss and the Singaporeans, who have greatly relaxed regulations to attract people to either the Crypto Valley in Zug, Switzerland, or to Singapore, which sees a lot of promise in this technology. But frankly, the money comes in from all over the world. Anyone with an internet connection can invest. And this is really all by way of saying that you're in an unregulated market where no sovereign authority in one country can really do much to stop the flow of capital. Not that they aren't trying, for sure, but um, you're seeing an era of regulatory competition where the um, most minimal regulation is probably going to be the one that wins out. And I think it's very interesting. It looks to me like the revival of many of these Chicago theories from the 1930s that were brought out to object to the Securities Acts of 1933 and 34 and have never really died down in the Chicago Law School critique. Um, what, what you're seeing is something that would make Henry Manny very happy, it would make Coase very happy, and so forth. I'm sure it would make Henry Manny very happy. I'm not so sure about Ronald Coase. He was much more open-minded on that front than, than Henry Manny. But, but I think you're absolutely right. That's what, what, what the point I wanted to go, is precisely this issue of regulation. I think that uh, uh, we are in a global economy, but the capital market is very segmented and segmented by regulation. And uh, the big innovation of uh, the ICO is that uh, they succeed in bypassing completely regulation, also because they by bypass the banking sector that by and large has been enabled or in charge of maintaining regulation around the world because uh, the United States with their very sort of uh, aggressive approach, they have become the policemen of the world. And, and, uh, but they have become the policemen uh, through the banking sector and through the clearing of the dollar. The moment you create an alternative to that, uh, then this disappears, and we're probably down to uh, minimum regulation unless there is international coordination on, on, on this. So now I want to ask your opinion of, of all of you, but I want to start with you, David, on uh, do you really think that uh, at some point the government is not going to fight back? So imagine for a second that Bitcoin is successful, is becoming an important source of uh, um, trade, uh, is an important uh, currency, uh, and basically the seniorage is completely taken away. Uh, do you think that uh, the U.S. government or the Chinese government or, or even, uh, uh, actually there is no European government, but anyway, uh, you get the point. They, they will sort of uh, roll over that and say, sure, we lose, uh, uh, what, 0.5% of GDP in revenue and we don't do anything about this? I think they're already fighting back. and. Um in fact, the, the logical extension of them is to try to co-opt the technology, which was the last set of slides that I showed. Um, one of the really interesting moments for me, I got into this area five years ago, and within six months, I was at the BIS in Basel in a room with our friend Rajan and many of the other leading central bankers, and they were scared to death of this. They knew all about it, and they were asking really the same question you just asked. Now, we do have examples of countries like Venezuela where Bitcoin has actually become quite big because of the utter failure and inability of the local government to regulate the, the old financial system. So when you say but, quite big, how many transactions are done in Bitcoin in Venezuela? I don't know, but one, one sees a huge amount of media coverage about how this being the only way to get money in and out of the country. Um, I've heard about Daniel Paravicini sending money to his mom in Bitcoin in, in Venezuela and so forth. Um, but I think compared to the boulevard, it's, it's actually doing quite well. Now, of course, people in Venezuela are mostly using the U.S. dollar, I would imagine, and so forth. Um, I think in the long run, though, that that's exactly what Nakamoto was trying to create here, was something that would undermine the sovereign power of central banks. And, for a lonely person posting a white paper on the web, I think there's been a remarkable degree of success after 10 years. And it's caused the central banks to reconsider everything about the way that they approach their own control of the monetary system. I think they are fighting back because they feel that they have to. And um, it's going to be very interesting to see how this unfolds over 20 years, 50 years, and so forth. Eric, what do you think? Let me make, make one point, maybe, maybe two points. On, on the question of 
will regulators um, or will, will governments, uh, if, if Bitcoin becomes more useful, how will governments react? The, the point I would make there is, I've had several now Bitcoin developers make the argument to me that a, a way around, or, and, and Bitcoin in, investors make the argument to me that a way around the logic of my paper would be for governments to more explicitly uh, regulate Bitcoin. Um, and in particular, um, make, an make it so that an attack, which is just adding different entries to a distributed, uh, to, to, the, to the, you know, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, make an attack illegal. And, and I, I've always seen that as a, a bit of a have your cake and eat it, eat it too argument of we want to be, we want to have a currency that's an anonymous, decentralized, skirts regulation, um, is, is international, doesn't, isn't, um, but if, it, if it's attacked, we want you to go after the attacker with, with military force. So that's the point I want to make about your, it's, it's a little, it's, it's sort of the opposite of, of the instinct you had, which is that if it gets big, regulators will want to clamp down on it. The Bitcoin people who have reacted to my paper have said, oh, if it gets big, regulators should embrace it and make an attack less, um, you know, less, less feasible. And, and the economic interests, by the way, are, are different, right? You're, you're thinking about the economic interest of a government. Um, the Bitcoin advocates are thinking about the economic interests of large holders of Bitcoin, and those, those interests might be, uh, might be divergent. Um, so that, that's the main point I want to make in response to your, in response to your question. I might chime in after Adair with the second Adair. point. So if I can turn the question to talking about an example that David brought up earlier in the central bank in China versus Alipay. So what's going on in China with, with Alibaba uh, owning a huge portion of consumption and, and payment system um, and credit for that, for that matter, um, and the role of the central bank in thinking about how these, new, these alternative currencies where the, the Alipay system becomes a, a currency, if you will, and, or if you put it in the U.S. context, the target gift card becomes a currency. And, I, I, you know, I, I think that when we talk about the government and currency and we talk about the store of value and, and, and these things that we have to, at some point, integrate what the, where transactions come into play because transactions and the, 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 the proof of work it, obviously, that's not going to work. And so when we think about currency, we're kind of combining people that do um, local, you know, small, small transaction fintech with people that do macro currency and monetary policy. And bridging those conversations is not somewhere we were gone yet, which, David, you interestingly brought out, and how the central bank then would like to play a role in regulation of having a piece of oversight over, the, over the, the ledger that a company like Alibaba might have. And I think this is in order to get to, to bridge the conversation of where the government, um, how the government feels about the future and their, their control of their currency, we have to start to understand what the government of China is doing with regards to Alibaba and Alipay and, and how the U.S. government thinks about these things with regards to either a Visa or MasterCard or where we're, we're going in the future with, with, with Amazon and other, other sort of types of, of these consumption entities. And so I think we need to put transactions into the thinking and we're not there yet. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think it's very interesting how they've handled Jack Ma in particular. You know, who's the most powerful man in China today? Is it the great dictator Chairman Xi or is it Jack Ma? And I was really struck by the fact that they pushed Jack Ma into retirement in September. He's now leading a life of contemplation and good works. I think in the old days they would have shot him. And you now have, um, they, they realize that they can't get along without Alipay and I would toss into the mix WeChat Pay as well. Um, I was in Berlin for a crypto conference a couple weeks ago and I went into Kade Ve, the great luxury department store and they accept WeChat Pay at Cade Ve, and you know, they know their market of the Chinese travelers and so forth. Um, I think ultimately the Chinese are dealing with a problem that is confined within their borders because Alipay and um, WeChat are, are essentially domestic companies. 
But the really interesting cases would be the four big multinational tech companies. If Facebook issues its own money, or Amazon, or Google, or Apple. And um, there was a story about a week ago about Facebook just dipping its toe and beginning to look at this. But I think um, if Zuckerberg wants to reinvent himself as a central banker, um, this is extremely threatening, you know, that no one country can, you know, there's a couple billion people on his network, on his platform, and, you know, even more perhaps on Google. And the ability to vacuum up transactions and bypass the regular financial system is very, very interesting. And um, I think they're hesitant to get regulators angry, but in the long run that this is going to be a fight that one way or another we're, go we're going to see play out. I don't think it's limited uh, within the border of China. I was recently in India, and uh, Tencent has invested in, uh, in Paytm, and Paytm is widely accepted even in the local markets because thanks to de demonetization, they sort of had a huge push in the adoption of, of Paytm. So I think it's, it's a global problem. I want to ask a last question, but I want to prepare because I will open up the floor. But because this is taped, you should come up and, uh, and ask your question in the microphone. So why don't you start uh, thinking a question and lining up for the question there. And I want to ask the last question myself, which is um, in bringing to the future of central banking. Uh, central banks could have opened up digital money to the public at large years ago. So it's not, you don't need the blockchain you can do it with digital money. And, and uh, what I love of this, all this debate about blockchain and uh, et cetera is that it forces people to go down to fundamental. And then you ask the question, why, for example, in the United States, if you are a bank, you can deposit your money at the Fed and get an interest. And if you are an individual, you cannot deposit your money at the Fed and get an interest. In fact, if you deposit at the bank, the bank does not give you any interest, but then they take that money, they deposit the Fed, they get an interest. And uh, when I explained this to a congressman, he was shocked. He said, how can, how can we allow this? Uh, so in, in a sense, why do you think that is all now and why people have not been more aggressive with uh, expansion of digital money before? Because we can dispose, and actually Sweden is in that direction, but we can dispose of, uh, of cash, or we could have disposed of cash long before Nakamoto. Yeah, I, I would give two answers. One historical, that in the 1930s, the so-called Chicago Plan proposed exactly this, and it's been revived by the future money people at the Bank of England. But I think the more modern answer is simply this, yeah. you know, that the smartphone has enabled not only transaction platforms, but things like um, Uber and so forth. You know, that this, this device has been so revolutionary that it has impacted the finance industry, even as it has also impacted transportation, hospitality, and, and many other things. And what you're describing is really a function of um, innovation in telecom, probably led by Apple. Can, can I just, you're, you're talking about getting rid of cash, and you, you mentioned India. Uh, we, we, of course, know the scenario from India, which would be duplicated here in the United States as well. When you get rid of cash, it's not um, it's not good for everyone, right? There, there's um, in the United States, we like to talk about people that are unbanked, which is a term I don't like at all, because the financial system is not set up for the low-income people in terms of the fee system and other things, and and there are other financial services, but people work in cash economy, and when we move this direction, we need to think about the incidence of the cost and who's going to bear the cost. And, and, and uh, before we jump, um, there, the, the, it's not a, a complete surprise that, that places like Sweden are ahead where the inequality is much tight, you know, it's much smaller, and, and you just don't have a, a, what, a poverty class in, in large proportions. And, and so I, I, I do think it, that we need to not forget about these these issues as we go down this digital currency conversation, even though the, the population all has the smartphone at this point, even in, in reaching across the income distribution, but, but what we're using it for and what we're paying for and the cost of it uh, is not, the incidence is not, is, is not uniform. 
actually a little anecdote to your point. I think your point is very well taken out there, but in India, Modi, before uh, doing the, the demonetization, introduced the mandatory banking of the entire population. So the banks were forced to open a bank account to everybody. Now, as it turns out, those bank accounts were used by people to re-launder the money afterward. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, is there any, yes, please. I have a question for uh, David. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that the blockchain had the capacity to replace the double entry bookkeeping principle as an accounting principle. Is that the case though? Or it is just that, that the double entry bookkeeping principle is taking place in the blockchain? And my question for Darren is, uh, uh, you mentioned that the blockchain it uses energy, but it also saves energy because it is replacing other services offered by alternatives. Are you taking into account the energy that is being saved because those alternative services are not being used? Um, on the point about bookkeeping, I think the blockchain system is superior to double entry bookkeeping because of the chaining together of records. And just because of the structure of the, of the database, if you change one entry, you change every subsequent entry, which makes it a self-auditing technology. In other words, if somebody tries to backdate or make a fraudulent entry into the ledger, it is blindingly obvious. And with double entry bookkeeping, you need to hire Ernst and Young to conduct a needle in the haystack exercise that often won't be successful. So I think the superiority simply comes from the ease. It, it forces people to tell the truth. The economists told it, they, they called it a trust machine that it's a technology that if you try to monkey around with the data, you'll get caught with a very high probability. And this is a huge advance. May, may I just make um, just one point to echo on that? I think that also speaks to an interesting research question for economists, um, which is, I think the, I, I, I'd echo what David, I agree with the point David just made. And I think to an economist researcher, to a finance researcher, um, even if the blockchain form of database the permissioned blockchain form of database isn't intellectually interesting to computer scientists. I think an open question is whether economists or financial finance researchers can capture if, if indeed there's something intellectually interesting that emerges from this particular form of database. And David mentioned one of the, th one of the things that emerges is this very robust tamper-proofness. So if, if you imagine a um, a consortium of banks that is uh, collaborating on a database in some way, they might all in some, in some way trust each other and be backed up by rule of law, um, but an employee going rogue or an employee trying to cover, cover their tracks or cover their you know, CYA in some, in, in some uh, more small scale manner becomes a lot less doable in a, in a blockchain style database than in a in some other uh, earlier forms of database. And I think that's just an interesting research question is to try to capture what's economically interesting about that form of database, even if from a computer science perspective, it's uh, pretty generic. So switching to the second questions about the transaction. So the, um, the Bitcoin blocks, they on average clear three transactions per second where the a visa or someone like that will, will clear a thousand times that. Um, furthermore, there's no mining. So uh, the, there is a cost associated with that, but it's negligible. But the broader point that you're bringing up is that the, these other transactions are not free, right? So when we charge things at a store, the, the store has to pay the, the one and a half percent interchange fee. And so the, the, the question about the interchange fee and what that, the, the, the right economic um, rent to that is and what it's being used for is open another area that's, that's the, the, the innovation suggests that we should do more research on that. There were experiments in Australia about a decade ago where they capped the interchange fees and the credit cards started charging more uh, annual fees. Um, the interchange fee, I like to think of it at least partially, is covering the, the, the costs of fraud coverage, right? And, and so it speaks to the, the questions here about, you know, the, the trust in the system and getting back to the whole innovations that we've been talking about. 
tying those things together in a tighter way is really, really would be interesting um, ground for research because I don't think we have the right economic number of what those, how those things map. Is there any other question? Please. Um, this is mostly a question for David. You mentioned ICOs earlier, and I was wondering um, what percent of these is just like gambling because there's typically a very low price for the investor and there seems to be a very low barrier to entry, right? Anybody can conduct their own ICO. And um, why would you even attack them if there are any attacks at all and if it's like gambling? Yeah, you know, the question you're asking is a universal question in investing. Like, you know, what's the difference between gambling and investing? Um, I think it's true that the, um, the costs of entry into this market are quite low. And I think it's also true that the death rate is very, very high. There have been other studies that have shown that, you know, 92% of ICOs never actually raise any money. And of those that do, half will fail in the first year. Um, we need more data about this, but you're, you're raising an issue about the value of speculation versus investing that is a timeless question and was as relevant to Keynes in the 1930s as it was to the tech people in the 90s and with ICOs today. Um, it's actually one of the questions that attracted me to finance when I was a doctoral student, but I'm not sure we've made a lot of progress in, at answering this. Um, I've been asked the... Um, question about the enrollment in my blockchain course at NYU. We now have more than 200 students a year. And a journalist asked me, how many of them are there because they're truly interested in it versus just there to you know, feed off the speculative frenzy? And I was a bit offended by the question. I said, of course, they're all interested in this. But you know, what motivates people to study a subject, to invest in a company, to own a token, um, a lot of it is probably due to mob psychology that is not very well integrated into our models. Is there any Please. So um, there is a forthcoming paper in uh, RFS called um, uh, Sex, Drugs, and Bitcoin. And uh, it's looking at the degree of speculative, uh, well, not speculative, but illegal activity uh, in Bitcoin. So they estimate 30% is, you know, things like drugs, child pornography, and the like. So your first impression would go and say, well, if that's basically, um, you know, the degree of illegal activity, maybe we should ban it altogether. But uh, the second line of argument that I would pinpoint is, you know, a bunch of uh, academics in Sydney could uh, pinpoint the exact accounts that were involved in these types of activity. So think about um, how much policing you can do with this type of transparency that the technology offers. So when, uh, when I think of it a bit more, it seems that possibly it's you know, the best possible uh, policing mechanism that uh, you can think about that might be you know, an extra value to regulators without doing an extra effort at all, you are already um, kind of detecting illegal activity just by looking at uh, the public records. And so um, just wondering, do you think there is a potential value for regulators to exploit without actually regulating uh, Bitcoin itself, but rather kind of uh, tuning into the already existing uh, data and uh, you know, just uh, free riding yeah. on that type of opportunity. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, the, the moment I decided to study this was when Ben Bernanke testified in the US Senate that he thought this was an interesting technology with a role to play in the financial system. And I thought for about a day, what does Bernanke, who runs the Federal Reserve, like about this? And I realized it's exactly the point you made. It's a ledger of all the tax avoiders, all the money launderers, and it's there forever. You know, they can take as much time as they want to figure out who you are. Um, I think this sex, drugs, and Bitcoin paper, which I know quite well, is interesting. It raises the question of how much of the real money is also used you know, for black market activity, which I don't think is zero. So, you know, what's the benchmark? 
But I think that paper um, is a little bit aggressive. It's really reporting an upper bound. It's showing that if I've ever bought drugs, they then scale up and say, let's assume all my transactions are bad, but even drug dealers buy food. And um, With we need guys. <laughs> I, I don't know how, how they pay for it. But um, I do think for everyone in the room, if you haven't figured this out already, if you intend to buy drugs or do other bad things today, probably the dumbest way to do it would be on a blockchain where you leave a trail for the government to come get you later. And we do have a guest speaker in our course who runs a firm called Chainalysis, who does exactly this work, and his main client is the U.S. government. And just one, one additional point on, this, on the sex, drugs, and Bitcoin topic is um, you, user, the use case of the illegal activity use case is exactly the kind of use case in which users on both sides of the transaction are willing to pay a large implicit tax to get the an anonymity afforded by the uh, afforded by that system relative to other ways of electronically transferring uh, money. Now, it's not not as anonymous as cash in Washington Square Park, but it's. Um, but it's, it's pretty good, and, and you know, there are a lot of different uh, ideas of how to make it even more anonymous. I, I, think of, I think of black market activity as a great use case economically of, um, of, of, this, anonymous, of this expensive anonymous decentralized trust. Now, that also raises fascinating legal questions of, well, then if it's so compelling for that use case, how do you, how do you prevent, how, how do you, um, uh, prevent that kind of activity, and it's kind of a cat and mouse game between uh, authorities and, and users. But it's exactly the kind of transaction in which the logic of my model suggests users should be willing to pay the large implicit tax of using uh, of using the blockchain. Okay, uh, do you, one last question. Yeah, hacking is a big concern with cryptocurrencies uh, and. Uh, yeah, as with uh, online uh, voting, uh, now I was uh, very inter uh, you know, uh, interested in uh, David's paper uh, on the topic. You know, I, I remember about two, three years ago, uh, one, uh, uh, one crypt uh, crypto exchange was hacked twice. Uh, and then subsequently went out of business. It was a smaller exchange, and I wonder what is the difference between the technology that they were using uh, versus Bitcoin uh, and and some of the bigger uh, uh, bigger things. And you know, uh, on a broader uh, you know in a broader sense, see, so this uh, sort of uh, this hacking concern it becomes a uh, war uh, between the hackers uh, and uh, you know I mean and the uh, and better locking technology. What are your thoughts uh, about this? Uh, any, any of I think most of the hacking, and you may be referring to Mt. Gox, but I'm, I'm not sure, but most of the hacking is occurring when exchanges don't protect the private keys, the, the cryptographic signatures. And um, there is now a movement a foot I read about this morning about people asking exchanges to return their coins and give back the private keys because there have been so many of these hacks. But it's important to realize that this is not a hack of the blockchain itself. It's a hack of the codes that are used to put transactions through the blockchain. And it is lamentable what a bad job some of these exchanges do. I think um, there are very different levels of quality and that you need to be very careful in entrusting your crypto to exchanges who may or may not be protecting your assets. I'd just like to point out the irony of the uh, proliferation of crypto exchanges, which is that the, the innovation was anonymous decentralized trust, and the users of cryptocurrencies or the speculators in cryptocurrencies or investors or whatever you want to call them are instead putting their trust in crypto exchanges that get hacked at alarming frequency, and who's, whether it's an outside hacker or an inside hacker, who knows? But I think there's just a there's just a swell irony there. You're absolutely right. Okay, with these parting words, uh, let me thank the, nice the, the yes, the panelists for a fantastic job and. Uh,